So yeah, no, I've been in security for years and years and years, and it wasn't a profession that I uh, saw academically. Like I didn't go out and say, I want to go work in security. It was a thing that I kind of fell into as a hobby. So years ago, I did uh, software engineering at university, actually, but I originally worked in tech support and then QA. In QA, I got my taste for breaking stuff and not having to fix it, which is a really nice aspect of being a QA. It's just like, hey, this thing's broken. Like, off you go. <laughs> you go fix it. Uh, and that kind of led me into the security rabbit hole when I started just looking at things, you know, from if any QA people or QA backgrounds here, you know, we do like functional testing and regression testing to see if things still work. And basically you're looking at a product or an application and you're looking for something, well, you're looking for everything to do what it should do, but also not do what it shouldn't do. And for me, there's very, very big similarities between the more traditional view of QA and quality assurance and security. And I started looking at products just kind of around my house, right? And, you know, it's like the, the biggest one that I did actually, um, just to show you, was, oh, no, nope, I agree. <laughs> How do we make Google go away? I agree. There we go. We just I agree to all of the pop-ups. Uh, it was this thing from back in 2014. And this was just the, the router that my internet company sent me at home here in the UK. And they send this thing out and you're supposed to, you know, you book in the engineer and the engineer comes like two weeks later and I was bored one night and I just started proxying the traffic to the device. So for one of the tools that I use very, very frequently, if anybody's interested in, in this, if you're on the Windows platform, I use this tool here called Fiddler. And it's just a really basic proxy. You know, many of you probably got experiences using uh, there's like fiddler if you're on mac i recommend charles that's the one that i used to use uh, there's other ones called burp and zap and they're, they're just simple proxies they proxy the traffic from the browser through to the device or the web application you're speaking to in this case it was the web interface of my router you can see here it was talking on a local ip and and I just kind of, you know, I was logging in, setting it up, looking at the requests, you know, how does, is there an API behind this? Like, how does the thing actually function? And I found myself seeing things that I was looking at them and I'm like, hmm, I'm pretty sure that that shouldn't work like that actually. And it transpired that it shouldn't work like that. And it became a huge big deal. I tried to report it to the company in a very responsible way. So for people not familiar with the industry, we have this term responsible disclosure and it's kind of like where, you know, people are looking at a product or a website. If you spot an issue and think, oh, wow, I can, you know, access other people's account data or I can do something that I'm not supposed to be able to do, you're supposed to get in touch with them and responsibly disclose and tell them like, hey, you know, EE, I've got your router and I found that I can do this thing. Now, <laughs> with a responsible disclosure, you kind of hope that the company is going to be grateful that you found the problem. Sometimes companies take this uh, the wrong way and they can kind of feel like you're hostile or you're a threat and they can not respond in the best of ways, which is what happened here. And ultimately, because they didn't kind of listen to the report and they didn't take this seriously and, and they try to silence me with, you know, threats and legal action and stuff rather than be like, oh, wow, we have a serious issue here that we should address. It gathered a lot of media attention. And ultimately, as a response of this, this happened throughout most of 2013. You can see the blog post here was published in 2014. Again, as part of the, the responsible process here, researchers like myself and others will not write up an issue and publish the details publicly until after it's resolved. So then, of course, no one can use the information in this article in hostile ways. So whenever you read things like this, it's probably some period of time before when it actually happened as well. Then ultimately, this gathered a lot of media attention, um, especially with like the BBC and other big broadcasters here in the UK, and led to me getting a job in the security industry. A company came to me and said, hey, you know, if you can find stuff like this in your spare time, would you like to come and do this for a living? Now, if you have a hobby and you like your hobby, the best way to ruin it is to go do it as a job because it's no longer a hobby when you get paid for it and you have to write reports at the end of the week. So, you know, kind of jokes aside, I was happy to go and work in the industry. It does change things a little bit. Uh, it's much more formal when you're what we call a penetration tester now. So another kind of industry term, penetration testers being these people and companies you can employ to come in and say, okay, we've built our application. We would like you to assess it for security issues. And again, I spent many, many years doing that. And it's a good profession. It's a good industry. It obviously has a very uh, well-defined place, especially with you know how big the web and, and online applications are becoming nowadays. And after doing this for years, I just felt like it wasn't the best possible approach for me personally. And 
you know, it was like a company would spend, um, you know, anywhere from like six months to two years on a project building this great big thing. And then we're about to release it. And then we will get Scott in to look for any security issues. And inevitably I'd find at least one or two, and then they would have to go back and, you know, refix all of these issues. And that usually led to them not liking me because we delay a project by finding some problem that needed solving. And a lot of the time it was like, well, you know, if we get involved sooner, we could kind of steer the ship around the iceberg and, and avoid the problem altogether. And that led me down more of a consultancy route rather than just penetration testing a product, you know, the week before it goes to production. It's like, well, bring us in as consultants. In the middle of the project, we can do like a quick review and we can kind of course correct and avoid some big issues. And that was really good for some of our clients at the time. And then we kind of said, well, how can we, you know, do this even better? Like, how can we get even more effective? And that ultimately led me to training. So one of the, the biggest things that I spend the majority of my time on now is training. And we have, there's only two courses that I do actually. And one of them is with a, another world renowned expert called Troy Hunt. Uh, and he has uh, this post here where he announced that me and him would be collaborating on this training. And this is a, a, a training course specifically on offensive security skills. And I'm actually going to be using our kind of demonstration application to do this now. So this is the website that we use from the training. And I'm going to be borrowing this for just a minute to, to demonstrate a natural attack now, just to show you like how easy this can be and how, for me, kind of like how simple it is. And, and that's really interesting that you can make an application do something that it's really not meant to do so easily and so simply. So first quick tip here, I've just kind of rebuilt this. We have like a rebuild process because it's open on the internet and it gets hacked all the time. So it may just explode and start working halfway through this demo, in which case I can quickly fix it. Um, but the first kind of quick thing, in order to use this application, you have to register. Now, if you ever have to register for a site and you don't want to give them your real email, there's this cool website called MailerNature. If you've not heard of it, um, so I'm just going to create like a random um, mailbox. And if I could spell Gotopia, right? There we go. So I now have created this mailbox on Mailinator called Gotopia. And I can just use that to register on here. Let's just do like at mailinator.com. So if a website forces you to give them an email and you've got to click a link or something, don't tell anyone I told you, but this is a really easy way <laughs> of getting around the problem. So I can register with that address. I'm now, I've got my account. I didn't put my real name in or anything. And if I go to Mailinator, you can see the, the activation email has come here. And you would, you know, if there was some kind of activation link, you'd be able to grab that from here. So a little quick tip there. If you ever want to log into a website and not give them your real email. Other than that, though, this is a pretty, um, it's a pretty basic um, application. It doesn't it has a lot of functionality that we might want to exploit. Of course, we've just seen registration and obviously then there's login. Uh, we have things like the, uh, the ability to vote. So I'm just going to close this window. There's some birds outside. I don't know if they're coming through on the, on the webinar. Um, so yeah, we have the ability to vote on these cards. If I go to the leaderboard, you can see there's a bunch of different vehicles on here. And it's kind of like a very, very simple top Trump application. You can register, you can then come to a car like this, uh, the Nissan GTR is a pretty cool car actually. And you can cast a vote. And you can say like, you know, this car rocks. And I can cast this vote. Now, of course, the application then shows my name and my comment, the number of votes went up. There's all obviously a database and things like this behind it as well. But I want to show you an issue we have here that's very common with things like comments or reviews or other similar uh, kind of features where the user can leave a string, some kind of data. In this case, it's a vote comment. It could even be something like your profile name, anywhere where a user can take a piece of data and give it to the application to be stored and then rendered back into a page later. So the particular issue I want to show and show how easy this is is it's cross-site scripting. Now, if you aren't familiar with cross-site scripting or any kind of common application-based attacks, the OWASP top 10 is the place to go and take a look. So OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project, and they produce this list kind of every few years now, where they say these are the top 10 most common threats that applications face online. Now, many times when you're getting a pen test or you know, looking for issues, you'll focus on the top 10 because of course the likelihood is that one of these will be in there. And the one we're about to look at specifically, as I said, is cross-site scripting. Um, someone's just posted a comment here saying WebGo in the Slack. So WebGo is um, it's an application that you can deploy yourself to attack. So you can run 
uh, like a local application. If you want to test your skills or hone your skills, there is WebGo. And there's actually another one called DVWA, which is the Damn Vulnerable Web App. Uh, so again, if you, know, if you want to test your skills or hone your skills as an attacker or learn new skills as someone interested, you can spin these up in virtual environments or host them locally and attack them. And then obviously you're not going to get into trouble. You can't go out and just attack websites on the internet. Hopefully we all, <laughs> hopefully we all agree on that part. But back to cross-site scripting. Now, when I see a website that lets me do this, lets me give it a string that it will store and then render back into a page, the immediate thing that I think of is cross-site scripting. So I've already voted on this car now. The application will prevent me from voting again to just spam it to the top. So I'm going to go find a different vehicle like the McLaren. Very nice car here. You can see it leaves your name and your comment gets put back into the page. So what if I do something a little bit naughty that maybe the developer did not kind of intend? What if I leave a comment that looks like this, right? So I'm opening up a script tag. I've got an alert, very simple demonstration, of course, that we call this a POC, which is a proof of concept. So an attacker and a researcher like myself will create a POC to prove that something is possible, but not necessarily actually do anything in particular. So this is a great POC for script injection. If I can make the alert box pop, it's proven that I can execute arbitrary script. So if I take this comment now and I vote, the idea, and, and it's happened instantly straight away, as you can see there on the page load, the idea now is that I've left the comment. You can see there is my first name and last name. Now, I didn't actually leave any text in the comment, but if we go and take a look in the developer tools just in here, and what I'll do is I'll just zoom in that console a little bit for you. You can see, of course, you know, I've placed the comment. It was a script tag with an alert. That's been presumably stored in the database. And then when the page loads again, the application takes all comments and puts them back into the page. And this is, in its simplest form to demonstrate, this is something called cross-site scripting, which is basically when an attacker finds some way to take script that shouldn't be there and place it into your application. Now, there are many different ways to do this. More specifically, the way that I'm demonstrating here is what we call persistent cross-site scripting. Now, persistent means that there is no requirement for you as the user to do anything in particular now. So if I, for example, take this page link and share it into the Slack, you will all be able to go to that page and see that the same thing happens because that script is now persistently in the page. There is another, there's a couple more variants of cross-site scripting actually, and I can show you uh, one of them very quickly just now. And let's do something like this one. Now, again, I've, I'm not gonna go into the depths of this one. I just wanted to show that there's different ways to do this. This is what we would call a reflected cross-site scripting attack. Now, the difference between these is that the actual hostile script payload, again, I've just shared my URL into the Slack channel for you. You can see that the actual payload, the, the hostile script payload itself is embedded into the URL search term there. So a reflected attack is slightly different to persistent because in order for you to fall victim to this attack, I would need you to visit that very specific link. So there are different ways to get that script into the page. Uh, persistent is more dangerous because obviously anyone that naturally visits that page now, you know, if I, if I go back to that McLaren, it's still going to be there. The script is still going to execute because it's persistent. It's a persistent cross-site scripting attack. So different ways to do cross-site scripting. There are different ways to get script into the page that should not be there. And there's kind of two main ways of resolving this. Now, the first one, for any developers in here, you may be familiar with the idea of output encoding. So, you know, in, in the simplest of terms, if I go back to this comment here, and I'll just make this a bit larger again, if this was properly output encoded, so if the application took this string, this comment, and output encoded it, these script tags here would actually be rendered as, you know, your ampersand LT semicolon script, ampersand GT semicolon. So if this was properly output encoded, it would completely neutralize the attack. And that is the, the number one defense against cross-site scripting is to properly encode these outputs. In a context-sensitive fashion, the other attack uh, payload that I showed you there is slightly different on the answer to that one, but you must do output encoding in a context-sensitive way. Now, that's the, the number one way to stop this, and that's the place that you should go to first. However, you know, sometimes I've seen it in applications myself, and this application exhibits the same characteristics, 
the output encoding is not always consistently applied. Sometimes people may forget an input on one page and not another, or even different inputs and outputs on the same page. So we have another kind of second line of defense which isn't something I'm going to go into too deeply, but I do want to mention it because I find that generally people are familiar and understand the concept of output encoding more than content security policy. So content security policy would be your second line of defense against an attack like cross-site scripting. It's like your backup. As, as we say in the industry, we have this term that is defense in depth. It's always better to have two protections for the same issue than one because if your first line protection lets you down, you can always fall back on your second one. Now, content security policy is just a HTTP response header that allows you to configure security controls that are natively built into the browser. And what I find most often, very, very few websites actually deploy this. And if I do conferences or consultancy, or if I just speak to people in general, it's not because they didn't want content security policy or they couldn't be bothered to deploy it. The most frequent thing that I find is that when I tell people about content security policy, the general response is, Wow, I didn't know that was there. That's pretty cool. Thanks for telling me. So there's this kind of common feeling that people don't put enough effort into security or aren't interested enough. From my own experience, I just find that the information hasn't been shared widely enough that really powerful mechanisms like this exist. So just to show you what it looks like, uh, I'm going to use this website here called Security Headers, and it scans the HTTP response headers of a website. So I've just scanned my own website. And you can see if I scroll down here, I'll just zoom a little bit just so it's big enough. You can see there is a HTTP response header. You know, we've got things you're familiar with like the date and the server and the cookie header, et cetera. The content security policy is just another response header. And in the policy, you define a series of rules that apply to the page. And one of the things that you can control that you can see just here is script. So you can control script on your own application. And by creating this allow list of scripts that are good, Therefore, all other scripts not, not kind of covered are blocked automatically. And that includes things like inline script, like the one that I just showed you. Now, CSP is a very powerful mechanism. And I have a whole series of blog posts and tools to help you understand more if this sounds like something you're interested in. But just to clarify, very quick recap now before I open it up to some questions is... The, the number one defense here is proper output encoding. We need to treat all user provided data as hostile. These comments are hostile. And another thing that I would see missed is something like the name. So people might say, ah, oh, well, the comment, yes, we'll output encode that, but they won't output encode my name. Now, what if I was to go to my profile and change my name to, you know, something like open script tag, et cetera, et cetera. Anything, anything that comes from outside the application must be treated as hostile. And I very, very often find this, this mismatch in the application of defenses where, you know, the comment would be encoded, but my name wouldn't. Well, I'll just put the script tag in my first name. Thank you very much for playing. So this is a common thing that I see. So it's another kind of little gotcha to, um, to look out for. But what I want to do is I, I want to have the ability to take some Q&As. I know I showed you a few different links there, actually. And what I'll do at the end here now is I'll gather up all those links and drop them into the Slack so that you, you have every single thing that I've just shown you. So don't worry if you miss something there. I just want to make sure that I have the time to take a few questions from anyone in the audience or if anyone, you know, has anyone done something on this site? Because this site's live and you're welcome to come and follow along and do this with me. I give you my permission to have a go at this website. So see if you can replicate that and, and just see how easy it can be in some scenarios to do that.